All right, let's pray and then we'll open the word for tonight. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that it heals us, Father, that it teaches us, it gives us wisdom and helps us understand how to walk wisely in the world today. We thank you for the Holy Spirit on the inside of us who empowers us, Father, and who teaches us in all things. And we pray that as we're here to hear your word tonight, Father, that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher, that we'll hear and that we'll understand, that we'll be reminded to put into practice the things that you need us to. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week we talked about the importance of abiding in the vine and abiding in God. And that really was an introduction to talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Because abiding in God is how the fruit come forth out of us. They grow out of our constant fellowship with God. So if there's no constant fellowship, there will only be little fruit. And it's important to understand it grows out of our fellowship with Him. And why do we want to abide in and fellowship with God? Well, last week from John 15, we read, because he promises to answer prayer. He says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask what you will and it will be done for you. And I know to a lot of people that just seems outlandish, maybe almost impossible. And, you know, sometimes people... You know, they feel like their prayers aren't being answered, and there's reasons for that that we're not going to talk about today. But what he did say was, if we abide in him, if his word abides in us, we will pray and we will be answered. We will get answers. We will know what to do, and we will be able to do it. And we also need to abide in fellowship with him so that we will bear the fruit that he wants us to bear. So we're going to, as we open this up, turn to Galatians chapter 5 to read about the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, starting at verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And we walk in the Spirit by abiding and fellowshipping with God. And you know from that list, the first fruit of the Spirit on it is love. And that's because the rest spring forth from that. And so we're going to start out by turning back to Matthew, and we're going to look at what Jesus said about this, because this was important to Jesus, and we're going to look a little bit in First John also. You know, John called himself the disciple that Jesus loved, and he talks a lot about love in his book also. Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 35. And it says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, in other words, he's really saying here, everything that they taught in the Old Testament can be summed up with these two, these two commands. All that stuff that was taught, love the Lord your God and love other people. Now let's look at Mark chapter 12, which is the same story, but Mark got something else out of it. Mark 12, starting at verse 28. And this is a little bit more about the guy that asked it. It says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, 
perceiving that he, Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. And that is important because he was noticing that love, walking in love, is worth more than all those sacrifices. I think it means more to God also. And I think he was also kind of saying it may be a little harder. It may be a little harder than just doing your duty to constantly be on that way. And then we know that Jesus changed this a little bit right before he went to the cross. Let's look at John chapter 13 because those two things are what were in the Old Testament. And he changed it slightly, but it is an important change. John chapter 13, verse 34. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now he changed that. I mean, loving your neighbor as yourself is good because it means basically treat other people the way you want to be treated. That's fine. But he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to pour out the Spirit for these people to be filled with the Spirit. And he said, love one another as I have loved you. And God's love is different than man's love. And I think they had experienced it a little bit there, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them yet. In 1 Corinthians 12.31, says that the great, maybe we'll turn there. I wrote the note, but we'll just turn there. First Corinthians 12.31, because we'll start looking at other things around it. Okay, so First Corinthians 12 is about the gifts of the Spirit. And this is the last verse in that chapter. It says, but earnestly desire the best gift, and yet I show you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. You see, love is the true test of spirituality. Sometimes people think that the gifts of the Spirit are. But love is the true test of the spirituality. The gifts get their power from walking in love. And you really can't have those things moving and operating without love. But love is the, is the litmus test. Okay, And that's worth noting because I know many Christians today that are looking at the gifts of the Spirit to decide whether or not someone is spiritual. They're also looking to wisdom and understanding. That's not biblical. And I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say it. We need to remember God used the donkey to talk to Balaam. Okay, so what that tells us is when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, even animals, yes. even animals can get in on that if they have to. Okay, and I'm not putting it down, but we've had our focus off place for a while, and we need to get it back in the right place. Walking in love is the true test of spirituality. Jesus said that his disciples would be known by their love. Not by their prophecy, by their miracles, their healings, or their, or their words. And another reason why this is important is because in Revelation it does say 
that there are going to be people who perform lying signs and wonders. It's going to happen. And if we're looking at those people and thinking those signs and wonders are showing their spirituality, we may, we may get off base and start thinking things that aren't there. Not that they don't accompany it, but walking in love is the true test of spirituality. You know, even when Moses was performing his signs, Pharaoh's guys were able to do a little bit of that too. And we are going to see that again in the end time. So we have to know what we're looking for. And love is what we're looking for because that is how Jesus said we would know that people are following him. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, the first three verses. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. We have to do what we do out of a heart of love or it doesn't even count. And if that's really what it's saying here. Tongues are just noise without love. Prophecy and faith are useless without it because faith works by love. Galatians 5, 6. We have to remember that. Even as people major on faith, if you want to be a faith person and see it work, you have got to be a love person. Because if it's not coming out of a heart of love, it's not going to work. Even our giving doesn't matter without it. Love is our witness test and our greatest quest. That is what we need to be pursuing. That is what Jesus told us. Let's turn to First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in us, so we do have the ability to love. So let's say that out loud. Say, I love God, I love God. And, I love and I love others. We need to say that and focus ourselves on that every day, no matter what's going on. I mean, that's something that we can say every morning. I love God. And I love other people. Before we ever meet any other person that we may be tempted not to love, I love God, I love other people, and I forgive. Before they've even done anything, I forgive. Because that's the baseline for walking in love. Now, I am going to read from the Amplified, 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4. I had to mark it in my book because my Amplified Bible has been way late right now, but here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 from the Amplified. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. 
Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. Love never fails. One thing we can do to start to walk in this is read that every day and put your name in it. That's something that Gloria Copeland wrote about in her book, saying, for example, Christian endures long and is patient and kind. Kristen is never envious or boils over with jealousy. That's one of the things that we can do and we can say and go on through that because when we're hearing the word and speaking it and hearing ourselves speak it, it does a little bit more for us than when we just reading it to ourselves silently. In addition to speaking the words out of your mouth, we also need to do a love checkup every day. You know, we read what love is all about, and the world admires those traits, and a lot of times the world even admires the fruit of the Spirit, but the world does not help bring them forth in you. They may look at somebody like that and think they're extraordinary, but they're not helping you to do it. Some of the most common attributes in worldly people today that are the opposite of love, the first thing is selfishness. Thinking about yourself rather than others. And only paying attention to yourself. And one place where this plays out really badly is on the road. On the road. Have you noticed that? And, you know, we have some guest ministers who are even afraid to drive around here. So, you know, it's not like that everywhere. But it is like that here. I mean, if you flip on your blinker, you know, they'll try to keep you out. I mean, usually if you flipped on your blinker in the old days, somebody would back off and let you in because they realized you needed to do something. Now they try to keep you out. And so nobody uses their blinker. <laughs> anyway, that's selfishness. Understand that selfishness. That's only thinking about yourself. And people do it in a multitude of ways. But we are not supposed to be like that. Another attribute in the world is that's very prevalent today is the taking of offense. People carrying grudges, people not forgiving, and they think it's okay. They actually seem to think it's the right way, the right way to be. It's not. Not according to God. Another thing that the world tends to go for is revenge. Some people teach others, their children to get back and to hurt the people who have hurt you and that's the way that's the way you're supposed to do it. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says you're supposed to love your enemies. And the last symptom that's in the world today is just all the criticalness, criticizing other people. You realize most of our news right now consists of people saying what has been done and then deciding and trying to convince others about whether what was done was right or wrong, and they tear everything that everybody does apart. Why is that a problem? Well, if we hear it all the time, if it's always coming in, guess what's going to happen? If we're abiding with that, what's going to happen? It's going to start coming out of us. It's going to start changing us. There is just no way around the need to separate yourself from the world in some of these things because if you're putting it in all the time it will change who you are. The Bible has always said that we are influenced by the people that we hang around and even worldly people and positivity coaches you know will say stuff like you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. You know whether that's a real person or a news channel or a movie channel, whatever, wherever, whoever you're spending the most time with, that is influencing you. We can control who we spend our time with, but 
a lot of people think we can control whether or not it influences us. Well, that scripture doesn't bear that one up. You can't control it influencing you. What you have to take control over is where you're spending your time. Because wherever and whoever you're spending that time with, they're influencing you. And so it's important that they be godly. Because... Those who abide in and with God will have the fruit of love in their lives. Maybe not fully developed, but growing every day. That's the point, growing every day. Becoming more like him every day. Christians who choose to abide in and walk with worldly people will have those opposite characteristics working in their lives. Again, because that's who they're living with and who they're abiding with every day. They're going to influence us. So we need to choose wisely where we spend our time. Because as the Amplified Bible says, we have to make love our great aim and our greatest quest. And that means we have to give our love walk our full attention. We have to put effort into it. As the end times progress, there are going to be more and more things happening to get our eyes off of what is important. There's going to be more trouble and more problems. And the Bible says that. And then the closer we get to it, the more there's going to be. And, I mean, people already feel overwhelmed at times with what's going on, but there's going to be more. It's going to be heaped up. That's what the Bible says. We have to be ready for it, and we have to be prepared to stay focused. People are seeking knowledge and information about these things, but they're forgetting the basics of the faith, which this is one of the things that Jesus said. You have got to walk in love. You have to love God, and you have to love people. It's basic to our faith. Without it, faith doesn't work. Prayers aren't answered. And notice, Jesus said to his disciples about the end times, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith in the earth? Will he find faith in the earth? Faith that's operational. What does faith work by? Love. If he's going to find faith, he has to have people here who are willing to love and to walk in love. That's the only way it's going to happen. Because if we don't love people, there won't be any faith. If there is a faith problem, or what some people would classify as a faith problem, that's also indicative of a love problem. If faith isn't working, there may be a problem with the love walk. And sometimes it's not about what we believe, it's about how we're expressing it and whether or not we're walking in love. So don't be sidetracked off of love. It is the test of spirituality. It is the first of the fruit of the Spirit. God is love. And as we abide in fellowship with Him, we are going to be made into love. Romans 5.5 5 says that God's love has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We have seen God's love and when we received the Holy Spirit, God who is love took up residence in our hearts. Every born-again person can do this because every person that belongs to God has the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Let's turn back to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John 14. Starting at verse 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Every born-again person has the Holy Spirit in their hearts. He came to us when we were born again. And being filled with the Spirit is extra power, but He came 
when we were born again. The Spirit came into our hearts. And let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Walking in love is important, and it is the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is also something we need to realize that we can do. We can do this with the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We can do this. He's there to put this fruit on our tree. And I think sometimes people read through that the First Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and what they look at, I mean, everybody agrees, oh, yeah, that'd be a really great person. But a lot of times people walk away thinking that's impossible. And we have to stop looking at the Bible and just saying, oh, that's impossible. It, you know, maybe somebody else can do it, but I can't do it. No. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you absolutely can do it. It's what you were recreated to be, to walk in love and to be a light and a disciple. And we can do it. It's possible because that's who we are. However, it does take, like I said, focus. And the yielding to the Spirit, abiding in Him, Living contact happens every day. Abiding in Him has to happen every day. It's consistency. And if you've ever done anything, whether it's, I mean, there's consistency in the Word and in prayer, but even if it's a diet, if it's exercise, anytime you've ever tried to make a change, anybody who's ever done it knows where does the power come When does the change happen? When we are consistent, when we do it every day. One day, two days, that's not going to make a difference. We have to commit to doing it every day. And that's what we need to do with love also. We connect with God through prayer, reading the Bible, reading the Word, and through praise and worship. And God's love for us as we see Him And our love for him, remember he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And what was his two commandments? Love God and love other people. Those are the commandments that he needs us to keep. If we love him, we'll do that. Our love for him and his love for us will motivate us to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And we need to connect with God every day because every day there will be tests and trials in those areas. That's why it's in there. Because every day these areas will be tried. 1 Corinthians 10.13 promises that with every trial there's a way of escape. With every trial there's a way of escape. So again, this is something that we are able to to do with the help of the Holy Spirit, not by ourselves necessarily, but it's possible. It's possible, and it's what we were born to do, and it's what God God wants us to be. It takes yielding to the Spirit within you to find those ways of escape and to be patient, kind, and long-suffering with people when you're tempted to be otherwise. To not be jealous, as Corinthians says, to not think too much of ourselves and our rights, to not be touchy or fretful or resentful, to take no account of a suffered wrong and forgive instead. But in all this, we need to remember that love never fails. When God was telling us to do this, he was setting us up to be successful. He was setting us up to be able to have our prayers answered. He's setting us up to be able to be blessed and to be a blessing. Because there's another thing, a lot of people look at love and they think it's weakness. It's not weakness. It's strength. It takes a strong person to forgive. It takes a strong person and somebody that knows their God to just let, to let somebody else go ahead. 
and take even what maybe you thought was yours. I mean, there's some of that stuff in that Sermon on the Mount that people, you know, like where Jesus said, you know, people look at it and they're like, give to everybody who asks of you. Did he really mean that? Did he really mean that? Yeah, he, he really did. He says if they compel you to go one mile, go two. Did he really mean that? Yeah, he did. If you go back to Matthew 5 and, and read all that, it's there and people and people look and I, I think for so long people have just glossed over it and been like, oh no, there must be some hidden meaning. There's no hidden meaning. He just meant what he said and it is what it is. And But you realize to give somebody else that right, to give to everybody who asks of you, what do you have to know? What do you have to know? That God is your source, right? That he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and God will repay. That's what gives you the strength to do these things, to go and act the extra mile with a person. It comes through love and it comes through knowing God and being able to tap into him in order to do it. Love isn't weakness. It's a strength to be able to walk like that. And it's strength that always, always, always brings victory. And remember at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, it says that faith, hope, and love all, all abide. They will all continue even into eternity. But it says the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. And that's why it needs to be we need to turn our eyes back on to that. That needs to be our great quest or our great aim. Not faith. Not hope. Love has to come first. Neither of the other two will work without it. And so if things don't seem to be working quite right, that's where we need to go back and we need to look at. We need to go back and look at the love and see if we're walking in love because love is the greatest love comes first and all the other things we do if they're not done in love they're not going to count for anything and they may not even have the effect that we want them to have love is the most important thing loving God and loving people and that's why we need to give it our full attention and our full focus but we also need to realize that it's not, it, it doesn't come through works. It comes through communing with God every day. Yes, if we get with God, we will be able to do these things. But it's not about the works. It's about being with God and connecting with Him. That's where it comes from. It flows out of our hearts. And that's the only way that we can do it correctly. And that's all I had for tonight. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you showed us how to love and how to care for other people when you sent Jesus to lay his life down for us so that we could be brought back into fellowship with you. Father, we thank you for that. And we thank you that because we fellowship with you, because of what he did, we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, Father. And I pray, Father, that as we go throughout our week, that the Holy Spirit will remind us of these things, will remind us how important love is, Father, will help us to get our focus back where it belongs so that we will have hope, so that our faith will work, so that our prayers will be answered, Father. We will have victory and we will have victory to share with other people to be a help to them and a light to them. And we thank you for it, Father. We thank you for putting the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we could be what you need us to be and we can be your disciples and your ambassadors. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.